Amen. So the title of the sermon I, uh, tonight is, If the Hat Fits, Wear It. If the Hat Fits, Wear It. And we'll get into why I named it that here in a little bit. But really what I want to preach to you about tonight is preaching. And specifically what I want to preach to you about is hard preaching. What is hard preaching? Or what is it that makes hard preaching? Now we've probably all heard that term uh, if we're e even, you know, if we're associated with this church or churches like it. Or this movement, you know, we all we've all understand what the term hard preaching is, and that's when a preacher gets up and preach a, preaches a message that's difficult for some people to receive. You know, or they get up and they rip on sin, or they rip on, uh, you know, a heresy, or whatever it might be. But really, what makes hard preaching is the fact that it's personal. I mean, that's really the hardest preaching there is when when the preacher starts to hit on your sin, when the preacher starts to hit on. Uh, you know, something that you're guilty of, that's what we, I would call hard preaching. Now you say, well, no, no, you know, hard preaching is ripping on the homos. It is, but here's the thing, for the homo, it's personal, right? So hard preaching is personal. I mean, that's why they get all uh, worked up about when they hear some man of God get up and say it like it is, you know, that what they do is an abomination before God and worthy of death. And that's why they freak out. But why is that? Because it's personal to them. You know, and any hard preaching is personal preaching. So hard preaching is when it gets personal. And really some of the hardest preaching is when God's, uh, the preaching is directed at God's people. I mean, it's really easy to get up and just rip on a bunch of people that aren't even allowed here. Right? We're not going to let the homos through the door. You know, and it's really easy just to, just to rip on them and, call, and, and, and say what it is. Now, you, I say it's easy, but for, for apparently for some preachers it's not easy. You know, they even shy away from that. and they, they let them come on in. They're so afraid of them, they bring them into the church. That's another sermon. But really, the hardest preaching there is is preaching that starts to get personal with us when it starts to land in the pew. You know, we all say, oh, we love hard preaching, but do we really? You know, I mean, some of the hard preaching is when it starts to fall in our lap. And really, that's when we start to see what people are really made of. You know, whether or not, you know, they're just along for the show or whether they're, they're on, you know, they're in this, uh, for the long haul or if they're serious about wanting to make changes in their life and getting things right and really serving God. So that is what hard preaching is. It's hard preaching is personal preaching and more specifically it's preaching that's directed at God's people. The Bible says that judgment must begin in the house of God. So you're there in Isaiah chapter 58. Look at verse 1. It says there, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. So that is a directive. That is an order to the preacher. That is the manner in which he ought to preach. He ought to cry aloud. He ought to spare not. He ought to lift up his voice like a trumpet. You know, he ought to be loud. He ought to project. He ought to be, speak with authority. He ought to, he ought to say uh, what he says with conviction and, 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 and uh, being genuine and with authority. But notice there at the end there, it says, and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. So we see not the, only the manner in which he is to preach, you know, the, the actual uh, you know, doing of it, lifting up his voice, but what is it that he is supposed to preach? What is it that, Jake, uh, that Isaiah was supposed to uh, spare not about? It was their sins. It was their transgressions. You know, and it's, it's no wonder that God had to tell Isaiah to preach in this manner. In fact, he had to command him to preach in this manner because as men, the tendency is, you know, you know I'm a person who doesn't enjoy confrontation. I just want everyone to be at peace almost to a fault. You know, and that's a dangerous characteristic to have if you're going to be a preacher. You have to look out for that. Because, you know, because the thing is, do I don't want to get up and talk about other people's transgressions or other people's shortcomings or preach on their sins because it, it gets awkward, because it creates conflict, because people get offended. But that's the way the preacher is supposed to preach. He's supposed to show people their sins. And he's not, to, he's not to spare about it. He says, spare not. Don't hold back. Preach the whole thing. You know, nail it down. Tell them what's wrong so that they can get it right. He says, show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. So what makes hard preaching hard preaching is because it's personal. You know, hard, face-ripping preaching is when it's personal. And it's demanded of a preacher to preach this way. Go ahead and turn over to Jonah chapter 3. It's not optional for the preacher. He can't say, well, you know, I don't want to be a hard preacher. You know, I just want to be a type of person who just wants to motivate people all the time. I just want to be the guy that just encourages everybody all the time. I just want to preach on doctrine all the time. There, we ought to preach all those things. We ought to preach every, there ought to be all manner of preaching that comes across the pulpit. But one thing that has to be there is hard, personal preaching 
that shows people their sins so that they can get things right. So <laughs> we see here in Jonah chapter 3, of course, Jonah was one that didn't want to go preach hard. You know, he, want, he didn't want to go preach the message that God had told him to preach. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He ran from God, and God had to chasten him severely. We know the story. But in Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the, the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. He's saying, look, don't go preach your own message. Don't go preach what you feel. Don't go preach what you think is appropriate to the people of Nineveh. Go preach the preaching, preaching that I bid thee. Go say what I told you to say. <laughs> and he goes so, in verse 3, So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days, and Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey. So get the idea of what the Bible's saying here. It was an exceeding great city of three days, and he began to enter into the city a day's journey. So when it says it was an exceeding great city of three days, that means that's how long it took you to walk across it. It, would, it was so big, it would take you three days to walk across that city. I mean, we just came out of a big city, you know, L.A. I mean, it took you, th it took you three days to drive out of that place. I mean, it was, it was three hours of, of driving to get out of there, you know. So you could imagine how big Nineveh was. It would take him three days. So, and, and, and so uh, Jonah goes in there, and he starts to preach, and he began to enter into a city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So he didn't go in there and preach a nice, soft, gentle message, did he? And he didn't do it just, you know, to a select group of people on the outskirts of town. He didn't wait in the suburbs and just caught a few people as they were coming in. He went into the heart of that city. He almost went halfway in. You know, he went a day's journey in and began to preach. You know, and I'm sure it wasn't just, you know, a message here or there. He was preaching hard. He was preaching long. And what was his message? And Nineveh shall be overthrown. You know, like, well, who's this guy? You know, hey, uh, excuse me, where are you from? Are you local here? You know, some guy just shows up and says, hey, God's going to destroy your city. But we know the story, what happened. Those people got right. And it goes to show you that hard preaching works. And that's why God wants personal preaching. That's why God wants hard, face-ripping preaching that deals with people's transgressions because that's when people get things right and make changes in their life. Go ahead and turn over to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. <clears throat> All of God's preachers are commanded to preach in this manner. I'm not saying all the time. I'm not saying every single sermon has to be getting up and trying to you know, make somebody squirm in their seat or make them feel uncomfortable. But it has to be there. We have to deal with sin. We have to help people grow in Christ. We have to help people get things right. And that requires people, preachers, to get up and preach hard sermons that are personal, that deal with us where we're at. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests, there were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah the king of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and unto the, uh, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem uh, captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, uh, before uh, I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a preacher unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. Thou shalt go to all that I send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. So he's saying, Look, I ordained you. I, have known about, I knew you were coming before you even existed. I had this planned out. I knew this was going to take place. I picked out a man. You're that man. And you're going to go where I tell you to go. And you're going to preach what I tell you to preach. He wasn't giving uh, Jeremiah an option. Say, go preach whatever you want, Jeremiah. Just go, just go tell them whatever you think is appropriate. He's saying, no, you're going to go tell them to, uh, what I want them to hear. You're going to speak to them the words that I want spoken. <laughs> Be not afraid of their faces, it says in verse 8. You know, and that's a, that's a real good tip for preachers. Be not afraid of their faces. Because when you start to preach things, people make faces. You know, people start to, they, they, and I don't think they realize it or not. I wonder sometimes what faces I made when I was sitting in the pews. You know, people, people you know, they're sitting there with their Bible going. You know, like, <laughs> like they don't, okay, not that bad. <clears throat> and sometimes you go, man, is this person getting upset? And it's probably just they're concentrating or whatever, you know. <laughs> but, you know, peop, uh, the preacher can go, oh, the, you know, uh, I said something that offended that person, looks like over there. You know, and then next thing you know, he does, well, I'm never going to do that again. Boy, I'm going to, I'm going to, I sure didn't appreciate, or I don't, I don't want to upset them. 
You know, he's saying, don't be afraid of their faces. Don't care if they scowl. If they make a, you know, if they look like you just a bite, bite out of a lemon because you said something <laughs> they didn't like. Preach it anyway. Preach the whole thing. Don't be afraid of their faces. Tear it up. <coughs> he says, be not afraid of their faces. Why? For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So again, the, the command of the preacher is to go and to preach God's words. And that's something we have to understand whenever we're listening to preaching. You know, if it starts to come down and, and land in our lap, if it starts to hit a little bit, a little bit closer to home, you have to understand something. It's not the preacher. Yeah, he's the one that's saying it. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's the Bible. At the end of the day, if his message is, is from the Bible, then it's God that's speaking. You know, he's just the channel. He's just something that, he's just the one, if he's obeying as Jeremiah did, the command to just preach God's words. You know, you have to ask yourself, who is it I'm really upset with? Who's really offending me here? Is it the preacher or is it God's word? <laughs> and if God's words offends, so be it, you know? And we as preachers should strive not to just get up and offend people for, uh, 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 you know, for offense's sake. For just, you know, I'm just going to try to offend somebody. You know, we never start out doing that. But if you preach the whole counsel of God, and if you preach everything that you're supposed to preach, you will offend people. And what they do with that is up to them. And if you sit in a church long enough where the Bible is being preached, you will get offended. And what you do with that is going to say a lot about you. And you have to understand something. It's not... It, you, you're, not, they're not just, you're not just being offended just so you can be offended. You're being offended because you're probably guilty of something and probably need to get something right. And you need to deal with it. He says, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have set thee this day over the nations and over the kingdoms. Now listen, to, let me show you. I want you to look at this in verse 10. Count with me. He said, this is the type of preaching that you're going to do. You're going to go to these people and this is what you're going to preach. And this is why you're going to preach what you're going to preach. To root out. I mean, rooting out, you know, going in and tunneling in and tearing something out. To root out and to pull down. These are not positive things. These are, these are actions of, of destruction, rooting something out. You know, the rotor rooter. You got you to gotta, you gotta root in your drain that's backing up the plumbing. You got to get the plumber over there. You know, he's not going down into the drain with a nice little, you know, little cotton brush to like coax the root out. <laughs> and say, no, no. You know, we've got a job to do here, and we'd really appreciate it if you would just move out of the way and stop growing over here. No, he sends down like a blade. I don't know exactly. I've never done it, but, it, you know, it's like on a blade, and it's on a motor, and it goes in there, just whips everything up, and shreds it. You know, he's rooting it out. That's what he's saying you're going to do. You're going to go there with your, my words in your mouth, and you're going to root out, and you're going to pull down. You know, the pulling down of strongholds. That's what preaching should do. People get strongholds in their life. They get strongholds of sin. They get into habits. They get into lifestyles. They get into living a certain way. And the preacher has to bring the word of God and preach the message and start to pull those things down. Not so that they can just be there barren with nothing, but that they're so why? So that they can build up again. That's what we'll see here in a minute. But he says you have to root out. You have to pull down. You have to destroy and to destroy. It's not enough just to root it out. It's not just to pull it, uh, pull it down. You've got to light that thing on fire. You know, cut the tree down and then put it in a wood chipper so that you can't ever put it back up again. Get the thing out of there once and for all. Destroy it to throw down. You know, climb up on top and start throwing it over the edge and tear that thing down, that sin, that, that life, whatever it is, to throw it down. And then, so we got one, to, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down. That's four negatives. And they end there and then he says to build. And we all like to build, right? And to plant. Well, that's a nice thought. You know, I'm going to go to church and the preacher's just going to, it's going to be like going out in the garden with the preacher. We're just going to take a little, a little tiny, tender plant. We're going to put it in the pot and we're going to put a little water on it and watch it grow. And it's going to be beautiful. Yeah, we're going to do that, but first we've got to get all the rocks out. And first we've got to get all the roots out of the way. And there's this great big tree that we have to tear down and destroy and get out of your life. And we do that through the preaching. So then we can build and then we can plant and then we can see God start to do something. But if all this other stuff's in the way, you can't build. I mean, it'd just be like if you wanted to build another structure somewhere. You know, you, you see these dilapidated buildings and they say, well, boy, that's a really great spot for, you know, this new building. With, we could put all these businesses in it. It could be very productive. There could be a lot of commerce going on. But there's this old burned out warehouse. We should destroy it. We should tear it down. We should pull that down. Whoa, don't be so negative. <laughs> you know, what are you saying? Destroy that building. Don't you know how long that building's been there? Everybody drives by and they recognize that building. It's like a landmark here. That's the problem, though. 
You know, it's too familiar. It needs to be destroyed out. And then when you get that lot cleared, then you can bring in the new. Then you can start to build. Then you can start to plant. Then you can start to see some positivity. But notice there, again, that's four negatives to two positives. You know, and the, and the positive comes after the negative. The building up and the planning, that comes after the rooting out. That comes after the pulling down. That comes after the destroying. That comes after the throwing down. And, you know, it just goes to show you that God's message is often more negative than positive. And if we've read our Bibles, we know that. I know there's a lot of negativity in the Bible. God does a lot of hard things. God has a lot of hard sayings. God deals with people very harshly at times. Not because he's just mean, but because people are stubborn and stiff-necked and sinful and rebellious, and God has to deal with us. And that's why preachers, again, they cannot be afraid of their faces. Say, oh, I know I'm supposed to destroy. I know I'm supposed to pull down. I know I'm supposed to do this. But I just don't want to offend anybody. But here's the thing. If you're, if you're, not, if you're going to be afraid of their faces and you're afraid to do all that, then you never get to build. Then you never get to plant. Then you never get to see that person change. You never get to see that person grow. You never get to see them bring forth in their life because the preacher's too afraid of preaching God's word. And really, you know, this is, and this is probably just more of a tip for anyone who would like to preach one day. You know, and, and it's a quality that has to be in a preacher if he's going to be a preacher. You have to have what I've heard called a killer instinct. You know, you can't, you can't just be one of these guys that just doesn't ever, ever want to go after anything. You know, uh, you know, some heresy creeps into the church and you just want to, well, you know, maybe there's something to it. And they just, they just understand things a little differently. And, you know, we just, we just want to get along. You know, that's not a killer instinct. You have to have that. You have to be able to call it out and say, that's heresy. We're not having it. Here's why it's heresy and kill it and get it out of there. Whether it's heresy, whether it's sin, whatever it is. Uh, a preacher has to have a killer instinct. And you know, if we don't understand what that means, we understand why. Now go ahead and turn over to uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. This is a great passage about what preaching should be like or what hard preaching is and, what, and the purpose of it. Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 10, the Bible says, The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. You know, the preacher wanted to know, what is should I preach? What's acceptable? What's good? What needs to be preached? And that, uh, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the master of assembly. He says the words of the wise are as goad. Now, what's a goad? A goad is a sharp, pointy stick that you would use to poke a stubborn animal in the backside to get it to move forward. Remember when Paul was going on the Damascus Road when he was still Saul at his conversion and the Lord came to him after he, he was struck with blindness and he came to him in that bright light and he said, Paul, uh, or Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? Lord, I am, I am Jesus Christ, whom thou persecutest. And what did he say to him? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He wasn't talking about some bramble bush. You know, it's hard for you to just walk up to a bush full of, of prickly pears and kick it. He was talking about the fact that God had been goading him that whole time. That God had been taking that goad and pricking him and trying to get him to move in the right direction. No, I am the Christ. No, these are my, my witnesses. I am the Messiah. Because remember, Saul had seen everything. They laid, uh, they, they laid uh, the, uh, the first martyr Stephen's feet at his, at, uh, clothes at his feet. He was consenting unto his death. He was brought up under Gamaliel. I mean, he, they all knew him in Jerusalem. There's no doubt Saul saw Christ, saw the Christ in it during his ministry. I mean, that, that's, not a, that's not a big leap to say that. So this whole time, Saul is probably pondering these things in his heart and wondering, and the Holy Spirit's just goading him, right? So that's what a goad is, is when someone's trying to move an animal. And that's what the Bible says the words of the wise are. When a preacher gets up and starts to preach the word, it's sometimes it's a sharp stick, and getting poked by it isn't any fun, is it? I mean, if I were to just pull out a sharp stick right now and just walk up and start poking you, you'd be like, God, you know, you'd probably grab it, snap it, come after me, you know, give me a bloody nose. It'd be, it'd be embarrassing. But that's, a, but that's the way preaching is sometimes. You know, sometimes a preacher has to get up and take out the sharp stick of God's word and just go, you need to move in this direction. You need to start doing this. You need to quit doing that. And it's not him. It's the, it's the stick that you don't like because that's what God's word does. It, it prods us. And hard preaching, personal preaching that gets down on our level and starts to deal with us has a purpose. 
And it's not to just make us feel bad. It's not to just make us, you know, the, 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 it's not just the preacher getting up and beating his chest. You know, it it's, it's, has a purpose. Now I'll read to you in 2 Timothy, it says in verse 4, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you would, turn over to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. You see, hard per preaching, personal preaching, it has a purpose. You know, that goad, that sharp stick, it has a purpose. When you're using it to poke that animal, you're, you're not just doing that for fun. You know, if you're into that, torturing animals, you know, stay away from me. You, you've probably got some, you know, that's, that's a major trait of being a... a, a uh, some kind of psychotic serial killer or something like that. They all start out with the animals, so please, you know. Even, even the wicked are cruel to his beast. <coughs> but, the, you know, Second Timothy 4 says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves, teacher, having itching, itching ears and shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. He's saying, you know why you got to reprove and why you got to rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine? Why you got to exhort? Why you got to do this, Timothy? Because there's going to be a time when people are just going to start wanting to cover their ears. They're not going to want to hear it. And that's not the time to pull back and say, well, let's just tell them what they want to hear. You need to tell them what they need to hear. He's saying, you need to keep, continue preaching these things in season, out of season. Be instant. So preaching should be as goads. They should move you in a specific direction. That's the point of it. When the preacher's taking it, so he's trying to get you to go in an area that you need to go because it's scriptural. <coughs> it's, it prod you into, like, for, for what example? Well, the prod you into living a righteous life. Prod you into getting that sin out of your life. Prod you into living for the Lord. Prod you into, you know, developing certain standards in your life. Uh, and, and, and such things. You know, it gets a lot more specific than that. Prod you away from sin and worldliness, right? Stop hanging out with those people. Stop hanging, uh, quit making that your entertainment. Quit, uh, quit doing that particular activity uh, because it has a purpose, and because there is a purpose in that preaching, it has to be specific, doesn't it? I mean, if I were just to get up and say, you know, we shouldn't have any, any world, you know, we should avoid worldly entertainment. You know, it's sinful, it's wicked. That's pretty general. And then everyone here could say, well, you know, then we, could, we get to make up our mind about what that means. You know, we should avoid sexual immorality. You can make that whatever you want. But if I get up and turn it over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and say, you know, you should avoid fornication. You know, and that, they, and that fornicators are cast out of the church. Now we just got specific, didn't we? <coughs> so that's the point. That's why it has to be specific. Because it has a purpose to move you away from sin and into a righteous type of living. And I think there's a good illustration of this. I've always enjoyed this story, and, and maybe, that maybe I haven't got this one just right, but I think we could use this here. I think we could apply this. If you're there in 2 Kings chapter 6, look verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell, uh, dwell with thee is too straight for us. They're not saying that they, they wish they were living in a place that's more crooked. It just means that there's not enough room. Let us go, we pray thee, under Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there that we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. But one said, uh, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came, uh, and, and by the way, I just love that part of the story too, where he's like, eh, you go ahead. And then they say, Will you come with us? He's like, Okay, I'll go. <laughs> You're like, Sometimes the preacher just wants to know that he's wanted, right? It's like, Oh, you guys go ahead. You know? And it's kind of a test. Well, do they really, do they really even want this guy around? Do they even really want him to do what he's supposed to do? Like, no, no, come along. Yeah, be content. And he's like, okay, I'll go. <laughs> and one said, be or, excuse me, I read that. Uh, verse 4. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. So this guy had borrowed an axe from somebody. And he's cutting down a tree. And the axe head goes flying off and lands in the river. You know, and apparently this was a real big deal because he's just like, alas, master. It's like, well, and, and we kind of like, we get a chuckle out of that. We got to remember, like, there wasn't a Harbor Freight around the corner back then. <laughs> you know, a, a sharp axe head was probably, took some time. I mean, they had to find that, that, that metal, refine it, boil it down, form it, and, and sharpen it. You know, it, they weren't, they're, it didn't say made in China on it, where they're like being made while we sleep, just hundreds an hour coming out. Right? So this was kind of a big deal. 
And he says, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. The man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore he said, Take it up to thee. And he took it. <coughs> to put out his hand and took it. So what we see here is this guy has a problem, right? He's in a, he's in a situation. He's got this problem in his life of having lost the axe head. You know, that's kind of like when we have a problem in our life. You know, we have a personal problem in our life. And, and we go to the, we, we like, and that's what the man of God is there for. Alas, master. No, I don't, I'm not saying we should be calling the preacher master, but he, he's saying, look, I got this problem. And how did, how did he handle it? He takes a stick and he throws it at it. And I love that picture. And that reminds me of preaching. Of somebody has a problem and we take the stick, we take the goads of God's word and we throw it at it. And say, let me just throw some Bible at you then. Let me see if I can take care of this problem by just throwing Bible at it. Taking a stick and throwing at it. You know, he didn't go waiting out there, pull up his pants, like, well, where was it? Is it over here? You know, trying to find that thing. He throws a stick. You know, he could have done anything. But to me, I always see that, I read that story, and I always pictures of, of you know, just pictures preaching him. You have a man of God just throwing a stick at it. At, at, at the problem, you know, and try to fix it. And it just shows us that addressing personal problems isn't always done gently. Sometimes you just throw a stick at it. You know, you, you know you're not, you're not going to go in there and dredge the river and try to find it and polish the stone, you know, polish the axe head and give it back to the guy. And, you know, he's just throwing sticks. It's not always done gently. And, and really what it shows us too is that hard preaching is less concerned with who's to blame. You know, who lost the axe head? He doesn't turn to the guy and just say, well, you're the one that lost it. It's your problem. Why do I have to fix it? You know, you're the one with the issue. Why don't you deal with it? You know, they, he came to the man of God for a reason. Because he wanted the problem dealt with. And, and, and it just goes to show you, the preacher didn't just turn around and blame him. Well, you know, you're the dummy who didn't you know, check the axe head. Well, did, you, did you hit the handle on the tree? Do you know how to swing that thing? What's your problem? You ever swung an axe before? That's not what he did. He just said, where fell it? He's more concerned with the solution than he is who to blame. He just sees the problem and says, well, let's just fix it. Let's just get the problem fixed so we can move on. So, and you know what? He didn't do it gently. He takes a stick and he throws it at it. He says, there it is. And, the, and it comes up and it swims. I love that it says it didn't float. Because remember, it's a river. Right? If it had just floated, it had been like, oh, there it is. Oh, there it goes. You know? Chase it. It swam. You ever think about that? The axe had swam in the river and it put out and he put out his hand and took it. It doesn't say you went in after it. That so that's just a cool story. It, it comes up and swims over to the bank. This axe head. Great you know? So I mean yeah, it was dealt with harshly. Yeah, it was maybe not the ideal way to maybe have done it, but it worked, didn't it? Yeah, maybe he threw some sticks. But you know what? Sticks and stones will break my bones. The words will never hurt me. It got the job done. That's all he's cared about. He's more concerned with the solution, getting that iron to swim, getting it back on the axe head. Why? So we can get back to work and get the job done of falling some timber and building something instead of just sitting around crying and boo-hooing about some sunken axe head. Let's fix the problem. Let's get it back on the, uh, where it belongs and let's get to work. That's what preaching is concerned with. And if it takes throwing some sticks, so be it. <laughs> you know, it's about fixing lives and getting people right with God. That's how, what hard preaching does. <laughs> and, it's, and it's accomplished in certain ways. And one way is it's, it's accomplished is calling out sin, right? We recall the story about when David fell into his sin with Bathsheba. And Nathan came and called him out, didn't it? And he said, we're going to deal with this. And God says, I'm not just going to let you get away with it. We're going to deal with this sin. We're going to fix it. We're going to make it right, David. And he goes to him and he says, you know, he, he gives him the whole story about the land. There was this man who had one lamb and another man came and took it and slew it. And David said, bring forth the man. You know, let's, let's kill him. And, and what did Nathan do? Thou art the man. Just calls him right out in front of everybody. Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed the king of Israel and delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. He says, thou art the man. And what was David's reactions? How dare you? How dare you insinuate that I am the problem here? No, what did he say? I have sinned. That's all he said. I have sinned. That was it. He just fessed up and said, you know what? You're right. And that's the reaction we ought to have when, when all a preacher is trying to do with the Word of God is get things right so that you can live a godly life. 
And, you know, so hard preaching is personal preaching. It has a purpose. And part of that purpose is fixing lives. It's getting people right with God. Another purpose that hard preaching has is maintaining order in a church. That's how you fix a lot of problems within a church, maintaining order. So that things don't just fall into chaos. It, 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 you do that through hard preaching. And that's really important. It's important that order is maintained in church. And what do I mean by that? I mean like specifically unity. That a group of people are united and have uh, 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 the same purpose and the same task and the same goal. <coughs> and we do accomplish that through preaching. The Bible says in Ephesians, if you would turn over to Philippians 3, go to Philippians 3, but the Bible says in Ephesians 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness with long suffering. You know, th these are things that ought to characterize us. Meekness, lowliness, long suffering. You know what that means? Being patient. Being patient with somebody. Giving people time to grow. Not just demanding things of people. That they be a certain way. That you, you have some idea of way people should be and then immediately they need to be that. We should be long-suffering with one another. You know, not everybody's in the same place in life when they walk through these doors. You know, and we shouldn't all think, well, everyone needs to be on the same page immediately. As long as people are pointed in the right direction and they're heading where they ought to be instead of backwards, you know, praise God. And let them grow at their own rate. Let them get there. They'll get there. Amen. And let the preacher worry about it. Let the preacher worry about where people are at. Let the pastor get up and deal with sin. Let the deacon get up and deal with it. You don't feel like you have to make sure everybody's dotting every I and crossing every T in their life so that you can give them your stamp of approval. <laughs> because we're more concerned about having unity and maintaining order so that why? So we can get the job done. Because there's a job to do. Go look at that map. There's more white than red on that map still. You still got a lot of work to do in Tucson. It's not getting any cooler. You know, we still got a few, we got about six to eight weeks of this. So instead of sitting here sweating about each other, let's go out there and sweat. You know, let's get, let's get hot under the collar and all worked up about the fact that people are dying and going to hell. <coughs> and do that with all lowliness and meekness. Those are qualities we ought to have. And uh, forbearing one another in love. You know, that's got to be there. This, is, this isn't just a suggestion. This is Paul writing the Ephesians saying, you know, I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you. This is him begging you, saying, would you please just forbear one another in love? Why? Endeavoring to keep the spirit of unity in the bond of peace. Don't let it fall apart. Don't break it up. Don't just let some rift come up and some stupid, trivial little thing tear you guys up and split you up and next thing you know you're arguing over something that doesn't even matter. He says endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There was one body, one faith, one spirit even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God the Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. You know we can accomplish more if we just focus on the task rather than one another. They that compare themselves among themselves are not wise the Bible says. You know why it's foolish to sit there and compare yourself to somebody else? Because you're focusing on the wrong thing. We ought to be more focused on the task that is at hand, the work that we've been given to do. And we can accomplish more when we do that. Instead of worrying about where everybody else, if we would just focus on the work that God has given us to do and not worry so much about everybody else. But you know what? That takes loneliness. That takes meekness. It takes long-suffering. It takes forbearing. It takes endeavoring to keep the bond of unity in the, in, uh, the bond of the spirit, in the, in the unity uh, of the spirit and the bond of peace. You have to try to do that. It's not just going to happen on its own. You know, you have to check your attitude. And that's a that's a big part of what preaching does for us, doesn't it? When we get up and preach the word of God, and we turn to Ephesians chapter four and we read these things. It says, "Whoa, is that me? Do I have meekness? Do I have lowliness? Oh, well, maybe not." You know, well, that's just the Bible checking your attitude. You know, it's not the end of your life. Nobody's perfect. We've all been there. You know, and we could all easily slip back into it. We can all get proud and puffed up. But let's just check it so we can get back to work. Checking attitudes. Look at Philippians chapter 3 where you are, verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for. You know, the brethren are dearly beloved and longed for. You know what? And maybe it's somebody you don't, you don't, maybe they're not dearly and beloved to you, but they're dearly and beloved to Christ. 
Every last one of them. Keep that in mind. Dearly and beloved and long for my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, dear, my dearly beloved. You, there's a lot of love and dearness and I mean, just a lot of feeling and emotion in this writing. It's like, it's almost as if Paul loves these people and cares about every single one of them and where they're at. Go figure. Do you think maybe we should adopt the same attitude? <laughs> I beseech Yodius and I beach, beseech Syntyche. Well, now that's personal. Paul, what are you doing? You just named names. You just said, hey, so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. I mean, in, in a letter that, how many people have read this? <laughs> so um, we're going to get to heaven like, are you Syntyche? Oh, you're that Syntyche? What was going on with you and the audience, huh? What was up? What was that over? You know? Oh, he bumped into my car in the parking lot. She didn't return my Tupperware. You know? I baked her uh, some brownies, and she never gave back my, my brownie pan. She thought she could just keep it. People get, people get bitter over the dumbest things. They go at each other. I'm telling you. <coughs> He says, I beseech Iodias and I beseech Syntyche, I'm begging them that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Look, you don't have to agree with everybody about everything in life. But can you be of the same mind in the Lord? When it comes to the things of God, can you have the same mind there? You know, maybe you like a certain brand of whatever more than another person. I mean, people argue, they have opinions and then they think that they're authoritative and we get into these arguments about stupid things like food. Right? I know, because we've done this. You all know what I'm talking about. Well, I think so and, that such and such place is better than such and such place. Oh, you're out of your mind. Are you crazy? How can you say that Culver's is as good as In-N-Out? You like crinkle cut fries? Man, they're fresh cut over there at In-N-Out. What's your problem? We can argue about that. That's fine. You know, that's all in good fun. But when it comes to the things in the house of God, when it comes to things in the Lord, we need to be the same mind. Oh, you think door-to-door -door soul winning is the way to go? Yes, I do. And you should too. Because that's the Bible example that we have. <coughs> so that's, that's the point of hard preaching. It, it maintains order. It, it gets people right. It's personal, but it has a goal. It rebukes heresy. Go over and turn over to Ezekiel chapter 3. It rebukes heresy. It checks attitudes. He says in 1 Timothy 1, I, this I char uh, charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou bidest them, uh, mightest, by, uh, mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which ha some having put away of, uh, concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, for the destruction that they may learn not to blaspheme. So he calls these people out by name. That's pretty personal preaching. That's hard preaching. And he says it's to blast and that they, they may learn not to blaspheme. There's nothing wrong with a preacher getting up and naming names and calling out sin and heresy. He needs to do it. It's his job. <clears throat> so we need to, we, uh, we, we see what that hard preaching is, is hard. What makes hard preaching hard is that it's personal, that it deals with us, every one of us, because none of us is perfect. And there's, you know, we might have this nailed down, but you know, this is popping up. We got to deal with this now. Then we get this down, and now we got to fix this. You know, we're not going to fix it all at once. We're not going to fix it overnight. It's a slow. It's line upon line. It's precept upon pre precept. Things people have to grow. It takes time. But that's what hard preaching is. It's dealing with those things. <coughs> and the question is, how do we respond to it when we hear hard preaching? When it starts to deal with us? When it starts to fall in our lap? How do we deal with it? <coughs> and by the way, hard preaching is always responded to. You're not, you're not going to respond to hard preaching. It's how you respond. Yeah. There's no neutral ground here. You're not just going to hear hard preaching that, that, that maybe you know, should offend you, and, and you're going to be like, well, I'm not offended. You're, you know what I mean? Like if you're guilty of something, and the preacher gets up and rips on that, and, and, and you're, you're just as guilty as sin on it, you're, gonna be, you're not going to not be offended. It's how you're going to respond. You're going to be offended, but what are you going to do with it? Just stay offended, or are you going to get it right? <coughs> so it's going to be responded to. <coughs> it's either embraced, you know, by people who want to do the right thing and move forward in their Christian life and get things right and live for God. They embrace it. They say, you know what? It's a hard saying. I know he's, but I know he's right. I got to deal with this. 
And I've heard that so many times. I know mean, I've been I've had to do that. I, I mean I've gotten up out of services where I the, it's like if that preacher wasn't preaching at me, I would like to know who it was. <laughs> you know, so that we, we, we he, that me and that person could compare notes. You know, or I could have a buddy be like, oh that you know, I'm guilty of that too. I've been in sermons like that. I've been in services where I've gotten up, ask my wife, she'll tell you, don't ask her. <laughs> but you know, where you get up was like, there's no fellowship after service tonight, honey. We're going straight home. Because <laughs> the preacher dealt with me in that sermon. I know he was talking about me because he quoted me. You know? <laughs> I've had that happen. I've been in those services where the preacher's de he's preaching at me. You know? Not just something I'm guilty of, but at me. And why would a preacher do that? Because if I'm guilty of it, probably other people are too. You know, because, you know, uh, there's no temptation that's taking with, but such as is common to man. The things that I'm struggling with, other people are struggling with. That's why it's good to preach on these things because, every, you know, if it's affecting one person, it's likely it's affecting somebody else. But how do we respond to it? And I've had to get up out of a service and grab the kids and the wife and go home and, and just grit my teeth and just squeeze the steering wheel all the way home. And I get home and I go, he's right. He's right. He's right. He's right. And eventually... You know, you, you soften up and you get it right. right. And it's not always easy, but at some point you just have to say, but he's right. And you know what? If it's, if it's, if it's this, he's right. Amen. And deal with it and get it right. <laughs> so it's either embraced and dealt with or it's rejected. Those are your two options when it comes to hard preaching. When it comes down the pike and it lands in your lap, you have two options. Two options. You can either deal with it and get it right, or you can reject it. And it's always rejected by people who are hard-hearted and stiff-necked. If you start you know, saying, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but I just, I just don't like it. And I'm not going to change. Well, you're hard-hearted and you're stiff-necked. That's what the Bible says. <clears throat> I mean, think about how many people, I mean, all these men that we've been reading about. You know, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Nehemiah, they're preaching hard, you know, Jonah, they're pre well, Jonah was received. But a lot of them preached very hard messages. And a lot of people, and the people they're preaching to didn't take it so well, did they? They took Jeremiah and threw him in a pit and said, starve. And somebody had to come save him and, and save his life. I mean, they, they did terrible things. I mean, Jesus came and preached some hard messages, didn't he? He dealt with some sin, didn't he? He got personal. When he started calling the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees hypocrites to their face, he started calling them, uh, you know, vipers, calling them all kinds of names. Oh, you shouldn't call names. Well, you should go tell Jesus that because he called people names. And they were, they were actually, and they were those things. He wasn't just saying it to, to be mean. They really were hypocrites. They really were vipers. They really were all of those things that he called them. And did they receive that well? No, they hung him on the cross. They lied about him and arrested him and tortured him. And then they killed him. And of course, we understand that he allowed that to happen. But that's what showed what was in their heart, didn't it? They were more than willing to do that. Instead of getting it right and saying, you know what? He's right. You know, we, we do leave off the weightier things of the law. You know, we are leaving some things undone. Boy, we, we really are hypocrites. We are shutting up the way of heaven to the other people. We, what's wrong with us? Let's get it right. Is that what they did? No. They ran. They wanted to gnash on him with their teeth. They wanted to cast him headlong down a mountain, throw him off a cliff, stone him. They wanted, couldn't wait to get their hands on him because people either embrace hard preaching or they reject it. And when we reject it, we become stiff-necked and hard-hearted people. And a lot of times, they, they direct all that anger at the one bringing the message. So, but here's the thing. Here, well, how do we handle hard-hearted people? How do you handle the stiff neck? You say, well, that person's just a little stubborn. They're just kind of set in their ways, and we should just, should just rock the boat. We should just let them kind of do their thing. You don't handle people with kid gloves. And I, always, I had to look that one up. You ever hear that? Who's heard that phrase, kid gloves, right? Nobody? Come on. It's, this is interactive. Oh, okay, we got one over here. We got to take her. Okay. Yeah, kid gloves. I always thought it was like, is that like junior size boxing gloves? Like, I didn't, I didn't get it, you know. 
or kid <laughs> or, or clothes that you would wear when boxing a child. Like, I didn't understand what they <laughs> meant by that. Like, like you, well, we're gonna box the kids, so we're gonna put those big kid gloves on that are like you know pillows, you know. But what it is 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 w is gloves that are made out of goat kids, of, of of baby goats, very soft and delicate that you would handle things with. Like if you had like an, uh, a very you know expensive piece of art or pottery or whatever, something that you just wanted to handle extra delicately, you would put on these little kid gloves, you know, the white, soft, supple leather gloves, and you would ha that's how you would handle things with it. <coughs> that's not how we're going to handle people that are stiff-necked and hard-hearted. Oh, let me just coddle you and let you just remain in your sin. No, that's not what a preacher's called to do, to handle people with kid gloves. His job is to take the gloves off, roll up the sleeves, and do business and take the word of God and start throwing some sticks and say, let's deal with the problem. Let's get it right. We got a job to do. Let's fix this. Let's go. Not to sit around and just like, oh, it's okay. We know you're just that way. No, we got to fix things so we can move forward. <coughs> the hard hearted are not handled. Click gloves. You're there in Ezekiel chapter 3. Look at verse 1. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, Eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak my words unto them. For thou art not sent unto a people of a strange speech of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Now to, not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst understand. Surely I had sent thee unto them, they would have hearkened unto thee. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. They said, they're not going to receive you, Ezekiel, because they won't receive me. You know why people reject the, the preacher? Because they reject this. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. And what's his response? It's there in verse 8. How does he deal with these impudent and hard-hearted people, the house of Israel, his own people? How does he deal with them? So I'm going to send you there with, with cake and chocolates and balloons and flowers and nice little flowery notes so you can win them over. Right? No. He says in verse 8, Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. And as an adamant harder than flint, I have made thy forehead. You say, you know what? They're hard-hearted and they're stiff-necked and I'm going to make, you, I'm gonna make your face hard. I mean, get the picture there. I have made thy face strong against their faces. I mean, he's going to preach the message and he's going to scowl. You know, he's going to have that look on his face. You remember when dad had that look on his face? And he did something wrong, he'd come in and he'd just have that, that furrow. And you just the look. You just get that look and you know you're in trouble. Right? He's mad. That's, the, that's what he's describing. I have made thy face strong against their faces. <coughs> thy forehead strong against their forehead. As an adamant harder than flint, I have made thy forehead. And I love that. You know, he, he said that's what a preacher has to have sometimes when he's dealing with people like this. He has to have uh, uh, an adamant, uh, his forehead has to be as an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Just an unflinching face that's ready to just do business. You know what I love? The fact that he uses flint. Because what do we use flint for? If you take flint and steel, you get sparks. And people want to throw something at the preacher or they want to they fire back and throw something at the flint of his forehead. You know, he's not going to flinch. You're just going to get sparks. Boom! And he's going to start a fire. Right? And he's going to deal with it. He's going to pull down and destroy. And he says, that's what I've made you, Ezekiel. I'm making you hard, uh, not hard-headed, but I'm making, giving you a strong face and a strong forehead as, as adamant and, and, and harder than flint to go and deal with these people. These people aren't being handled with kid gloves. He's not saying go there and, and speak, just talk them down and just reason with them and be rational and just try to understand their side of the story and sympathize. You know, and, then, and then tell them about your own mistakes that you've made and then you know, give a good example of something that they did right. And then, and then tell them what they did wrong and how they can fix it. You know, they, people have all these ways of how to deal with people that are making mistakes, right? And maybe in some situations that applies. But he's saying, you need to go there and deal with this. And he says there, fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. I mean, you know one of the hardest things about preaching is? is? is this type of preaching where you have to preach these type of messages. That's what I found out real quick about preaching. 
is that people come to church, they don't have it all together. Just like, you know, I don't have it all together. You know? And we have to start, and preachers have to start dealing with, with people where they're at and start doing with, with real sins and real problems and start preaching hard messages. And, and, and you're going to get some looks. And he says, though they be a rebellious house. And I'm not saying that people here are a rebellious house. But I mean, that's what Ezekiel was dealing with, wasn't it? He's saying, I know they're rebellious. I mean, imagine going and preaching. and You know you're like, it'd be like a preacher going down to one of these fag pride parades and tell them they're all going to burn and go to hell. Do you think they're all going to go, oh, oh, sorry, excuse us. Well, let, let's just go back in the closet. No, they're a rebellious house. They will run upon him, that preacher and they would, if they could, if the cops weren't there, tear him to shreds. I mean, why do you think when that protest went back on in 2016 at Verity Baptist Church, whose side of the barrier do you think the Sacramento Police Department was on? It wasn't on the Sodomite side. They weren't protecting the Sodomites saying, whoa, stay back from these independent fundamental Baptists. They're ready to just run upon you. They were on our side protecting the preachers and the people going into that church from that crowd. And there's a reason. And that, again, is another sermon. But that's the kind of preaching that has to take place. And that's the kind of preacher that hard, uh, preachers have to be. You know, and <laughs> here's the thing. If you ever find yourself in a position where you're clashing heads, where you're coming and saying, boy, the, and you're finding out that the preacher has a hard forehead and you're making sparks with him and you're throwing at, you know, yourself at flint and, and, and it's, it's making a, a little bit of a, uh, you know, a spark, guess who the problem is? Nine times out of ten. It's not the preacher. It's you. It's probably you're the problem. If you're saying, well, I don't like what he had to say. And you don't think that happens? I know preachers that have said women come up and they say, oh, you know that part in Ephesians where it says that women are to submit to their wives? Yeah, I, I crossed that out, see? Or they took a black marker and go, eh, see that preacher? See what I did? I went and crossed that right out of my Bible. That's wicked as hell. You're a rebellious woman. Can you imagine someone doing that? Or, or, or the, the preacher who looks down, I've, I've heard about this, and the, the sweet little old lady, or the preacher starts talking about women's roles and things like that. She just looks right at him, reaches up and turns down her hearing aid. <laughs> oh, 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 that's what you're preaching? Oh, okay. Let me just, go ahead. I am not listening to this. Who's the problem in that situation? It's not the preacher. It's the person with the black marker in their hand. Oh, I don't like this. Oh, I don't like this. If you're clashing heads with the preacher, you're probably the problem. And here's the warning. If that's you, you're going to be the one that suffers the consequences, not the preacher. Not the one who's bringing the message. It really it has no impact on my life. You know, if people embrace it or not, you know, if they get all offended and run off or whatever, that's their problem. I'm, it's not, I'm going to continue to serve God. If everybody in this church gets offended and leaves and this thing has to shut down, I've got a church to go to. I've got a great pastor. I'm going to be okay. <coughs> you know, so we need to make sure that's not, a, and I'm not saying that's going on. This is just preventative maintenance. This is just saying, hey, keep this in mind as we go forward. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, I'll never forget this verse because when I first got saved and I was being rebellious and stiff-necked, somebody wrote this verse down and put it somewhere that I would see it. They didn't have to say anything else. Proverbs 21 or 29, verse 1. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall be destroyed, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. I mean, you could sit there and buck at God's word and buck at the preaching of God's word and not like the hard preaching and say, well, I don't like it, I don't like it, I'm not going to change, I'm not going to fix it, I'm not going to get it right. Well, then prepare to be suddenly destroyed to the point where there is no remedy, without remedy. And people think, well, yeah, I know I'm going I'm to flirt around with sin, I'm going to mess around, I'm not going to get things right, and I know I'll probably suffer some consequences, but eventually, you know, when I get tired of that, I'll fix it. No, the Bible says there will be no remedy. Once it's done, it's done. You know, there's certain mistakes you can make in your life, there's no fixing it. You have to deal with that problem for the rest of your life. <clears throat> and Isaiah, uh, you know, I'm running out of time here, but go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 30. Actually, go back to Hebrews 12. We've got to move along for time. Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> you know, we either, we either embrace hard preaching 
and, 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 and deal with the problems that it's addressing or we suffer the consequences. Those are the two options. And rebellious people who get stiff-necked and hard-hearted, you know, they, they only harm themselves. And as a matter of fact, they're actually a benefit to other people in this way. They serve as a cautionary tale. That's what they serve as. They say, oh, did you see how that person messed everything up? How they were constantly reproved and didn't get it right and suddenly were destroyed without remedy? You see that, Ch you see that son? You see that guy over there? Do you see what they did? Don't be like that. Look what's happening to them. And the child goes, oh, you're right, dad. Oh, you're, you're, you're right, so-and-so. Hey, let me, let me show you what happens when somebody rejects the word of God long enough. You know, that's why I'm so, I was so thankful for the protesters that came to Faithful Word with their vile, disgusting, vulgar signs that said things that I can't repeat because they were that bad about God. Because <clears throat> I could take my, and they're, and they're just blaring it out of their mouth. And I could take my young daughter and say, do you see that sodomite over there? Do you see that wicked, filthy sign? The Bible's right, isn't it, daughter? That's a wicked person who's going to be destroyed suddenly without remedy. And they hate God's, God and His Word. And I, and I remember going to those protesters and said, I just appreciate you coming down here and spewing your filth so that our children could see that we were right about you the whole time. That's what I told them. And that's what rebellious, and I'm not saying every person that's rebellious ends up being a, that. But I'm saying, even in our own lives, even within this church, it's possible that we will see rebellious people come up who refuse and resist God, the preaching of God's word. And what it's end up happening is they will end up serving as a sign to others, as a cautionary tale. And we don't want, that's not, that's not what you want on the epitaph of your, of your tombstone. You know, other learned, pe people learn from his mistakes. You know, he, he served as a great sign of what not to do. Is that what you want said of you? No. Nobody wants that, but that's what happens to people. <clears throat> now, it's either rejected by, uh, by stiff-necked people, they reject hard preaching, or it's embraced by sincere people. People who really love God, people who really love the Bible, when they're reproved by the Bible, they love it. They say, let the righteous smite me. It shall be a blessing. Let him reprove me. It shall be as an excellent oil upon my head. They love it. I love hard preaching. I'm thankful that I got preached at those time, all those times. That I had a preacher that was got up and preached on my sin. And I knew he was preaching on my sin because we had a conversation just a few days before about my sin. And he didn't hesitate to get up and say, well, if you're dealing with it, I'm not saying it's up, hey, you know, Corbin, you know what I mean? And he and I were the only one that probably knew. But I'm sure it applied to many other people in the auditorium. And I'm, but I'm just saying, I'm glad for that. Yeah, I might have gotten up and oh, that preacher. But at the end of the day, I was glad for it. I said, thank God for somebody who will get up and just tell me like it is. And take the word of God and just say, thus saith the Lord. Now you deal with it. Praise God for that. It's embraced by sincere people. They love it. They take the hard preaching and say, thank you. And you know what they end up doing? They end up reaping the benefits Hard preaching works, friend. Hard preaching benefit people. I mean, it changes lives. People get out of sin. People get right with God. They go on and they live a, a joyful, wonderful, content Christian lives. They're fruitful. They're on their, you know, they're on their way to heaven. They're saved no matter what, but they're going to get there and enjoy benefits. They're going to have the rewards. Why? Because somebody preached hard at them. Because somebody got and said, you need to get this right and fix it. <clears throat> they reap the benefits. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Isn't that the truth? You know, it's like, I love getting whipped. No child goes, can I have a spanking? I just love spankings. It's great. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You know, people love our kids out in public. Oh, you have such well-behaved children. You know, they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't throw a fit. My wife's always getting compliments. They love that part. They love the fruit. They don't like the planning that goes on. They, they don't see everything that goes on at home. They don't hear the... Stop it. You get another one. Hold it in. 
They don't hear dad. Stick it out. <laughs> Stick it out farther. All the way out. Hold still. Little legs just sh shaking. <laughs> they don't, but they love the fruit, don't they? They're not. They're, they're asleep. They can't hear this. <coughs> they love the well-behaved children. They love the, the peaceable fruit of righteousness that, is, that it yields in them that are exercised thereby. But they don't like that grievous part. But it's necessary. You can't have one without the other. You have to have both. You have to have hard preaching for people to get things right. Or they just don't. Or they say, oh, I guess I'm fine. I guess I'm not doing anything wrong. The preacher never talks about it. Never brings it up. But when he gets to that passage, he just goes, well, uh, turn your, well, uh, keep turning. You know, he just, don't, never mind that. And you know what? That guy's no different than that lady. Might as well not be there. It's just as wicked. <coughs> Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. It makes people strong. And you get this idea, lift up the, the, the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Just these people are going through life, just kind of, uh, what does hard preaching do? You know, it makes them sit up a little straighter. They start to get things right. They start to deal with things. They can walk a little taller. They can walk a little straighter. They can have some confidence. <coughs> and make straight paths for your feet. They don't have to worry about where they're headed. Like, oh, if I, you know, if I keep doing this, where is it going to take me? If I, don't, if I don't get this right, where am I going to end up? Their path is straight. They know where they're going. They're doing the right thing. They're making the right decisions. They're living godly in Christ Jesus. They know that path is straight and where it's going to take them. <coughs> so this is the title, and this is the admonition tonight. If the hat fits, wear it. Put it on and say, this is me. This is where I'm at. This is what I have to deal with. If the hat fits, wear it. I told that title to somebody, they're like, it's if the shoe fits, wear it. <laughs> well, here's the thing. <laughs> it's if the shoes fit. Uh, so I'm not using that illustration because that reminds me of Cinderella. <laughs> you know, and I've heard both expressions, so I went with the hat fits. If the hat fits, wear it, friend. If the preacher gets up and says, thus saith the Lord, you say, boy, that, that just fits just right. The, don't try to take it off and pretend it doesn't fit you. Oh, that's not my hat. That must be somebody else's. No, that's your hat. Put it on. I mean, remember, what, when Nathan called out David, he owned up and said, I have sinned. He wore that hat. Adulterer. Murderer. Got called out. What did he do? Yep, that's my hat. I own it. That's me. Are we willing to do the same? To wear that hat? The preacher calls it out. You know, not long-suffering. Not meek, not patient. You know, whatever it is, whatever he, I mean, and just because, and here's the thing, what's great about just preaching the whole counsel of God, I don't have to wonder about what your sin is. I don't have to sit home and go, I wonder what so and so is into. I wonder how I could get them with the Word of God. I don't have to do that. I don't do that. All I have to do is just preach all of it and just wait. And eventually, it'll land. But the question is, when it does, are you willing to put that hat on and say, that's me, and deal with it? <clears throat> you see it, and again, I've gone too long, so I'm just going to close it up. But, you know, the Bible says in James 1.21 that, uh, now just turn there. James 1.21, we'll close here. Wherefore, beginning in verse 21, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his face in a glass. So he says, look, if you're someone who hears the word, but you don't do, you don't, you don't take any action, you're like a guy who goes to the mirror. And like, okay, like you stop by, you know, and you got yourself a chili dog on the way home or whatever, and then you get home, and you go and you look in the mirror, and there's just chili and cheese, like just all over, right? You get it on your shirt, and you just look in the glass, and you look in the mirror, and you don't do anything about it. Say, oh, I've got chili and cheese all over my face. I've got mayo all over. I look like a slob right now. And you walk out and say, and just go back out in the public like that. That's what it's like if we hear the word of God, if we, and, and we don't do anything with it. 
And if we hear, thus saith the Lord, and we go, well, that's me. That's my hat. I, should, I have to put that on. And you're, wearing, you're standing in the mirror and you have the hat on and you're like, that, I'm just going to keep wearing that. I'm not going to fix it. I'm not going to do anything about it. That's what it's like. If, for if any be a hearer of the word, verse 23, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. And, continue, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. He forgets that he's got crusty chili cheese all over his chin. And just goes out in public and somebody else has to point it out and say, hey, you got, you got a little schmutzen on the punum right there. Oh, I forgot about that. You know, and then mom's got to go, whose mom did that? Nobody's mom did that? Come on, you mom. Who's, mo who's a mom in here who's done that? <laughs> I'm a dad who's done it. Like, come here, you got something on your face. I swore to myself as a child, I'll never do that. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've done it. You got a little jelly right there. But well, that's what we're like when we, when we behold the word of God, when we, we look at it and say, oh, that's me. You know, I'm, I, this is my, that's my sin. Oh, that's nice. And just go about our business. And forget. You know, and the preacher's job, that's what his job is. Say, look, see, that's you. That's what you look like. Deal with it. If the hat fits, wear it. Put it on. Fix the problem. That's hard preaching, friend. That's what hard preaching does. It puts, it puts the hat in your hand and says, this is what you have to wear right now until you get it right. You have to wear this hat. And you can sit there and you can try to all the other hats, but they won't look right because they don't fit. You have to wear the hat that fits and, and get the problem fixed. <coughs> the Bible says, I'll, I'll close in Romans 12. I'll just, just listen. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, every man, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think of himself soberly. You know, be serious about it. And people need to develop an ability to step back out of a situation and observe themselves and say, and, and really examine what it is, how they're being or what they're behaving or what they're into. To think soberly about themselves. Be serious about it. According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. People need to just step back and say, what hat fits me? What, sh what, what, what hat am I wearing? Is it a good hat? Does it say soul winner on it? Bible reader, prayer warrior? Or does it say something else that we probably wouldn't want anybody else to read and say, oh, uh, uh, that's not my hat. Well, you're the one wearing it and it fits pretty good. So let the preaching of God's word cause you to think seriously. Let it cause you to think soberly. Let it cause you to think honestly. Let it put the hat on, wear the hat, and then fix it. You know, Embrace hard preaching. Don't be stiff-necked. Don't be hard-hearted. Be grateful for it. Because hard preaching is what changes people's lives. You know, and I, I won't go on. Let's just close in a word of prayer.